All right. All righty. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Ecosystems Genomics Seminar Series. Should we give people a couple minutes, Heather? Yes, that, that would be perfect. Thank you. Yeah. How are people doing? Good? Thumbs up? I like your official uh, Tefeli lab background, Taylor. Thank you. Yes, we had we put it all together for our um, environmental science presentation la on Monday right. <laughs> when we presented to the yeah. All right. Yeah, why don't you go ahead? Go ahead. Perfect. All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Taylor Portman. I am a master's student in the Tefali in Arnold Lab studying plant soil microbe interactions. And it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Paul Carini, who you may have run into in Bio5 or seen online if you had the pleasure of taking his environmental science microbiology course last semester. Um, he's an assistant professor here in the University of Arizona Environmental <clears throat> Science Department, where he studies the molecular mechanisms and evolutionary genetics of microbes in resource poor environments. Dr. Carini graduated from the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee with a master's in marine micro microbiology, then found his way to Oregon State University, where he got his PhD also in marine microbio. And from there, he joined the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science as a postdoc with Dr. Allison Santaro, followed by a second postdoc in 2017 with the Dr. Noah Fierre at the University of Colorado Boulder in soil microbial ecology. Today, Dr. Creaney will be presenting on some of his work here at the University of Arizona, looking at microbial systems ecology of desiccation, desiccation tolerance in non-spore forming soil bacteria. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Dr. Creaney. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful introduction. And thank you for the invitation um, to present to you all. Um, so basically, I'm going to talk about um, the kind of science that we do, give you an overview of the kind of science we do using this, this project we have of um, trying to understand desiccation tolerance as an example. Um, and how it links to ecosystem genomics and sort of a broader context and kind of where we're going with this project. So we seem to be um, finding new interesting things out as we proceed through this study. So hopefully you find it enjoyable. Let me know if you have any questions or comments um, either at the end of the talk or always feel free to email me. Um, for some of our other projects, you can visit our website. Here's a little QR code if you take your your camera uh, from your phone and turn it on and point it at that QR code. It should automatically recognize it and bring you right to um, our website um, in this case. You'll see these embedded throughout the talk and it's just kind of an easy way to bring you to papers that um, you, know, you might be interested in instead of having to write the citations down. I haven't had a chance to get all the QR codes in the talk so there are a couple of papers that you might still have to write something down if you wanna visit them. And um, I'm in, in the Department of Environmental Science, and I want to just acknowledge that the university and the field sites that we use and study are on Odom and Yaki lands here in Arizona. I also want to highlight the researchers that do the research um, in our lab group. Uh, this is our current team right here. Um, Dr. West, Dr. Snow and Boast West and Kyra Good are working on our Superfund research program projects. We won't have a time to talk about those today. Izzy is leading most of the uh, research you'll see today. Um, she's a master's student in our lab. And our newest member is Christina. Uh, she'll be working on some of our other soil microbiome projects. 
Most of the research you'll see today is uh, supported by, has been supported by the University of Arizona with some service awards from the JGI and continuing work will be supported by the NSF for these desiccation projects. So I just wanna start out by kind of talking about um, what I mean when I say microbial systems ecology. Um, what is that and what does it sort of encompass? Um, when we think about microbial ecology, we kind of think about these broad scale top down approaches of understanding the role of microbes in different ecosystems. For example, we might look at the distribution of different species across space or through time using biodiversity measurements. Nowadays, this is sort of your typical microbiome study where you have all these different species and their relative abundances um, as inferred from amplicon sequencing. You can also take bulk measurements of a sample. So uh, respiration rates would be a bulk measurement. It's sort of the sum of all the respiration in that sample. You could also add an isotope and track it through different uh, fractions, through different microbial populations, convert conversion from one compound to another compound. You could also use biomarker studies. So what comes to my mind is phospholipid fatty acid profiles. This used to be pretty widespread um, in microbial ecology. And of course, metagenomics and metatranscriptomics, where you sequence all of the DNA or the RNA from an environment and use statistical analyses and computers to assemble it and make some predictions about the ecosystem. Without question, the biodiversity measurements and the metagenomics in the last decade have completely revolutionized our perception of how microbes function in all environments all across the globe. But these studies are pretty limited in some really important ways. They're not really good at distinguishing novel biology, for example. They're not really good at actually pinning down specific interactions between microbes. We can see an association, but we don't necessarily know what is behind that association. So they're really good at this sort of very high level um, um, characterization of communities and the roles that microbes play in it. But to get at that sort of fine resolution, we need other approaches. This is where sort of bottom-up analyses come into play. So when I say bottom-up, I mean sort of the classic reductionist um, microbiology that you might be familiar with if you are classically trained in microbiology. So things like cultivation of microbes from the environment, studying them in the, in the laboratory, where you can take that complexity of the environment and really distill it down to a specific variable that you're studying through experimental design. So this is a, a really important tool to understand things like gene function um, and how the cells are actually responding to different perturbations. And then of course we can apply all of these approaches, transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics, in the context of systems biology to really understand how that cell is functioning under the specific perturbation that you're using in the lab in that condition. Of course, like microbial ecology, this is also limited. So one of the major limitations is this first one right here. We know we can't culture everything in the lab or we haven't cultured everything in the lab or some things are too difficult to culture in the lab that it's really not worthwhile. For example, we might be able to culture 20% at most of the soil microbiome which leaves 80% that we just don't understand anything about. The other thing is that the lab environment is really not that similar to the environment. It's its own environment. So what we learn in the lab may or may not be relevant in the environment. So you really need both of these approaches to, ah, okay, got it. Uh, hand hitting microphone, got it. Um, so what we really need both of these approaches to um, understand how microbes function in the ecosystem. So what our lab group tries to do is use cells as the bridge between these two ecosystems. So we isolate microbes from the environment. We um, study them in the lab in these sort of highly reductionist uh, methodologies and test ideas about um, how genes are functioning, what metabolites are produced, um, when they're expressed, under what settings and what conditions. So we kind of zoom in to that molecular level. And then we use the cells as a fulcrum point after we learn something in the lab, 
to go look for evidence that that's actually important in the environment. So for example, under phosphate limitation, we might observe a certain gene expressed in the lab, and then we'd go look in the environment and ask the question, are these cells actually experiencing phosphate limitation in the environment as evidenced by that gene being expressed in the environment as well? So our work really spans this continuum from molecules to ecosystems. And what we kind of call that is microbial systems ecology. It's systems biology to understand microbial ecology. And we can really kind of link this whole continuum together through that. You'll notice that I haven't talked about a specific ecosystem here. We don't actually study a specific ecosystem. It's this approach that kind of makes what we do kind of unique. And that's evidenced by the different kinds of projects that we have that are as different as they can be, basically. Um, we have a project where we're investigating how gut microbes in mice uh, metabolize arsenic and how those metabolites might affect host health. We have a new project coming on uh, pretty soon in a couple of weeks, investigating how microbes that were isolated from the bottom of the ocean persist at very, 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 very low growth rates that approach zero. And as we're going to talk about for the rest of the talk today, we study desiccation tolerance in non-spore forming microbes. So I just want to get us all oriented before we jump into this. Okay, I think most of us know where we are most of the time. Um, here is the Sonoran Desert in this sort of mustard yellow um, color here. It spans parts of Mexico, California, and Arizona. And we're located here in Tucson on the eastern side of that Sonoran Desert. And it's a beautiful place to live, as all of us know. We have these majestic mountains here. Uh, nice crystal clear blue sky, the, the bright green saguaros that look like they're ready to give you a, a hug. And in fact, I actually encourage all of you to go for a hike after this and really enjoy this weather because this beauty comes at a significant cost. And we call it summertime. So this is a, a plot of temperature and soil moisture from a soil probe that's about five centimeters below the surface in the desert. It's effectively real-time data. I think the data is collected every 30 seconds. And as you can see here, in about May, at the start of May, this is the year 2020, by the way, soil temperature starts to tickle at its high, about 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and reaches by July 1st, roughly, 122 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is the soil temperature, it's, and, and it's below the surface, a couple inches below the surface. At the same time, we have very, very, very low soil moisture contents, such that these are just basically baked sands. So this is a really stressful, harsh environment for microbes in soil. But we know that soil microbes can persist through this really hot, really dry period of time. And the evidence of this is that if we do a soil microbiome analysis, we detect all sorts of different phylotypes that are abundant and present in these soils. And we know that when the soils wet up again, there's some semblance of microbial activity in them. But during this hot dry period, effectively productivity is halted. Microbial productivity and plant productivity is halted. It's just too hot. So what our group is interested in understanding is really what are the mechanisms that enable these microbes to persist? So in order to kind of get a, a sense of that, we need to understand what the effects of dehydration and desiccation are on cell biology. After all, this is one of the most, um, most problematic stresses for all of life, um, but especially microbes, potentially especially microbes, I guess. Um, so when a cell dries out, water is removed from it, and the cell experiences all these different stresses, biochemical stress, physical stress, metabolic stress, and physiological stress. Reactive oxygen species build up and those interact with different cellular components, including DNA, the membranes, the proteins that get oxidized or otherwise modified. The cells shrink, their membranes become pretty brittle and sometimes leak, leading to the loss of ion potential, uh, membrane ion potential. 
uh, membrane proteins don't transport as effectively. And when the soil dries around these cells, you sort of have this concentrating effect where the substrates concentrate near the cells and eventually will precipitate out of solution, making them unavailable for microbes to use for respiration or other um, nutrient needs. So effectively, these cells enter this state of, and I, I don't want to call it dormancy, but it's kind of like dormancy. It's a poorly defined dormancy state, or they die, one of the two. So in order to, um, to, to cope with this, cells have to have mechanisms to kind of fight back a little bit. One of those mechanisms that cells use to kind of resist the stresses associated with desiccation might be dormancy. Um, dormancy is a last ditch effort to persist. And typically we think of dormancy as the formation of a spore. The most classic force spore forming bacteria are bacillus species. So they form an endospore and then filamentous streptomyces. They form these different aerial spores that are distributed uh, through the environment. So in this cartoon, we have this, um, you know, an active cell experiencing some stress going into quiescence or some sort of pre-dormant state. And then after extreme stress, a spore is formed. It's really unclear, however, if actual desiccation induces spore formation. Typically, we think of spore formation as being induced by nutrients, the lack of nutrients, although desiccation may cause the per perception by the cell of a lack of nutrients. Where there's sort of this big bottleneck is whether or not there's some form of quiescence or dormancy that is specific to, desicca uh, to desiccation. So in other words, do cells that are desiccated enter some sort of special form of dormancy that allows them to dry out completely and then come back to life? And is this important for non-spore formers? When we look at a soil microbiome, we do see streptomyces, we do see bacillus, but we see a whole lot of other microbes that don't form spores in that data set. So how do they persist through this? So in order to persist through that desiccation, these microbes have to be able to stabilize the cell, cellular constituents inside of the cell. They need to be able to prevent dehydration, induce damage. And then when they become rehydrated, they have to be able to repair everything that was damaged during dehydration. So what I'm showing you here is just a, a, a cartoon that illustrates some of the mechanisms that are known that microbes in general use to combat desiccation. We have upregulation of EPS biosynthesis, so exopolysaccharide is EPS. That's sort of like a, a sugar goo that they can secrete around the cell that helps prevent dehydration. We have upregulation of genes that are involved in the synthesis and transport of osmolites. These are organic compounds that help balance the solute potential across the membrane. We have upregulation of genes to repair DNA uh, damage and upregulation of genes to help mitigate uh, reactive oxygen species. So they're scavengers of reactive oxygen species compounds. What I find really fascinating about this slide is one word, and that's upregulation. So upregulation in the classic reductionist systems biology context means the synthesis of new Okay, I'll pick up right where I left off. Great. Okay, you see everything? Okay, so I don't know what happened there. That was weird. Um, so basically this question of whether or not genes are upregulated in desiccated cells is something that we're gonna come back to. Uh, so in order to study this, um, most of the studies that have contributed to this slide here are from cells that um, were isolated from non-desiccation environments. Uh, they were conducted on cells that are not uh, isolated from environments that experience desiccation. For example, Brady rhizobium was isolated in Florida, not exactly the driest place in the world. Um, some of these other microbes were isolated from soils in other more temperate, um, moist regions. Very few of those cells have been 
isolated from desert soils. So one of the first things we wanted to do is build a culture collection of um, microbes from arid environments in order to study them um, in the context of where we live. So the first two years our lab group was here, we really focused on building a deep culture collection of bacteria that were relevant to our ecosystem. So this is just a little cartoon showing some of those sites that we isolate from, um, starting at the bottom of um, the, the Santa Catalina Mountains, just outside of Tucson here, the Biosphere 2 site. And then we have several field sites going all the way up the mountains to the top. This ecosystem is really cool. We have a hot, dry um, Biosphere 2 site. And as you go up, it gets cooler and moister. But the whole ecosystem is going through a slow shift towards a drier climate. So it really gives us this opportunity to study um, how the ecosystems and the cells themselves may be adapting to climate change um, in, in the uh, arid Southwest. We use a bunch of different approaches to culture microbes, and I'm not gonna have time to go through how we do that. If you're interested in some of those uh, approaches, please visit this uh, QR code here. But in total right now, we have about 3000 cultures of diverse bacteria that we have access, to, that we have in our lab group that we could pull for study at any given point in time. We have a lot of alpha proteobacteria. We have a lot of acidobacteria. Both of those are important in the Southwest. So we started investigating desiccation tolerance originally in several strains of, of actinobacteria. Actinobacteria are known to be desiccation tolerant, but like everything, like everyone's experienced, COVID-19 had a way of changing our plans. Um, so we've reduced the scope of that project to investigate a single strain. Um, and this is an Arthrobacter cell that we isolated uh, from one of these sites. We chose this particular strain to study for a couple important reasons. First of all, we know it's present at most of our sites. We have Amplicon microbiome data showing that it's pretty widely distributed. Number two, it's desiccation tolerant, but it's a non-spore former. So it's really an opportunity for us to look at desiccation tolerance in a non-spore forming microbe. Number three, it's easy to grow in the lab. And really that was a very big factor in why we chose this is that it grows well. Some of our other strains, it takes you know like a month to see a colony on a plate. And um, with the impacts of COVID, that was just kind of too long to wait. So we started investigating um, how these cells uh, cope with desiccation tolerance using sort of a systems microbial ecology approach. Oops. Um, so the way we do this is we grow these cells up in the lab, nothing fancy here. This is just a, a typical uh, broth culture, if you will. We filter that culture down onto 25 millimeter filters and place those filters into a vented Petri dish. So air can get in and out of this Petri dish. And then we place all of those filters. So this is like an all day affair. Usually several people spend the day filtering. We're trying to make it more efficient, but we filter like 100 or 200 of these filters. It's kind of, it's kind of a long day um, as Izzy can attest to. Then we place those filters into um, what we've, these environmental chambers that we've designed. One is a control chamber that we always keep at 100% relative humidity to try and keep those cells hydrated that we filtered. And the other one, we slowly step down um, from 100% relative humidity all the way down to 25% relative humidity over a period of two weeks. This is just the inside of the chamber. We have a real-time temperature and humidity sensor that uh, the Meredith Lab was really critical in helping us get set up. And then we control the humidity within this chamber using either distilled water for 100% relative humidity or a series of saturated salts that absorb or release water um, in a specific manner to control the relative humidity within that chamber. So if we look at the data just from what the chamber looks like, here's our relative humidity um, on the left, and then we have our time elapsed on the right, on the bottom, sorry. Um, our control chamber is up here in blue. So you can see that, that, from, that this is the data from the sensor that it's always at 100% relative humidity throughout the entire experiment. 
And then we slowly step down this relative humidity in the chamber down to 25% relative humidity with one of these different salt solutions in this beaker. At the end of the experiment or at the end of the desiccation uh, process at day 14, we reintroduce water and then it comes right back up to a We isolated or extracted rather um, filters from the, these chambers, both the treatment and the control to make several measurements. So we have some survival assays. We're asking um, how likely are the cells to survive um, in the desiccated treatment relative to the control treatment to test what the specific effect of desiccation is on the survival. We um, collected samples for endometabolomes. So these are internal cellular metabolites. And then we collected samples for transcriptomes. And I'm gonna kind of walk you through this data. We don't have the data from the transcriptomes yet. So we don't have any gene expression data yet, but we do have some interesting findings that we collected along the way to that, um, to getting that data. Uh, hopefully we'll have that in the next month or two. That's another thing that's kind of been set back by delays associated with COVID. So we do these survival assays by simply taking a filter um, out, a cell-laden filter out of the treatment and the control chamber, and then resuspending the cells in water. So this is simultaneously a rehydration step, as well as sort of just getting the cells dispersed off of that filter, because they're kind of a little cake on that, on that filter. We then take a portion of that and count it, by staining it with a nucleic acid stain and getting cell counts with flow cytometry. And we plate a portion of that on Petri plates. And then we count the number of colonies that form on that Petri plate. So we calculate a metric for the treatment and a metric for the control, treat, uh, control sorry, the, yeah, the treatment and the control called percent culturability, which is just the number of CFUs that form divided by the total number of cells in solution. So what fraction of those cells were viable on the Petri plate? When we look at this data across um, the day two, day eight, and day 14, we have a pretty clear trend. So day two, um, so let me just orient the axes here. This is the relative survival. So this is the pairwise difference between the culturability of the controls and the treatments. Something at 100% right here is going to have no difference. So in other words, the culturability was the same in the treatment and the control. So at day two here, we had held the cultures at 100% relative humidity in both conditions. Looks like it happened again. <laughs> Hopefully he'll be able to join us soon. I can hear you. Can you hear me? We can hear you now. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, so the, the, the um, relative survival decreases um, as the cells are dried out. So this is really interesting and maybe not that surprising as we dry these cells out. Um, their survivability decreases. So we'll kind of file that away for a second here while we transition to um, what our metabolomes are showing us. Um, so at the same time that we extract samples for um, the survival assays, we collected uh, samples for metabolomes. And what I'm showing you here is um, what's called a volcano plot of the results of that. What we're doing is comparing the desiccated samples to the um, hydrated samples. On the left here, we're showing the negative log of the Q value. This is a, like a modified P value is one way to think about that. Anything above this dashed line is what we're considering significant. So a Q value of less than or equal to 0.05. Um, on the bottom axis here, we have uh, the log two fold change. So this is the difference in the relative or uh, the difference in the abundance of each metabolite that we measured. So things to the right are going to be more abundant in desiccated cells and things to the left are going to be more abundant in hydrated cells. We measured about 106 metabolites 
um, through a targeted analysis, and there's more data to come from that that we haven't analyzed yet. But we saw that about 40 compounds in total were differentially abundant across these two conditions, but the vast majority of them, 38 or 37, I think, were more abundant in the desiccated cells than in the hydrated cells. And what was really interesting is that most of the things that are more abundant in the desiccated cells are associated with nucleotides. This kind of caught me off guard. I thought we'd see osmolites or maybe some sugars um, that were produced indicative of maybe EPS production, something like that. But we saw all these nucleosides, specifically ribonucleosides. Now, these could be kind of coming from a number of different places. Um, they could be coming from um, you know, de novo biosynthesis, that the cells are some, for some reason synthesizing these in response to desiccation, or they could be coming from RNA breaking down. Um, but either way, this kind of piqued my interest immediately as something that was kind of unusual and unexpected. When we zoom into the, the four specific ribonucleosides that you would expect to see in RNA, um, and look at how those um, abundances change with desiccation. We see that at 100% relative humidity, so this first step in that ladder, that there's no difference between the treatment and the control. But as soon as you start desiccating these samples, the relative abundance of all four of these ribonucleosides go up in the desiccated samples. So this was really kind of interesting. Um, very unexpected. Um, we had this hunch that perhaps um, this was due to RNA breaking down in the cells, um, in the samples or on the filters. So we kind of had that data. So um, we, have, we have struggled with getting RNA out of some of these cells for a number of different reasons. And it seems like every time we tackle one thing, another one pops up a little bit like you know whack-a-mole. I think we've got it all figured out now, but it's taken uh, several months to do that. But one piece of data that we did get while we were trying to troubleshoot that is total RNA content of these cells that when we extract RNA from them. So what I'm showing you here is again, similar to that viability or survival analysis, we're looking at the relative RNA content in the desiccated samples relative to the control. Um, uh, if you're at, uh, if we, we would expect 100% if the treatment and the control are the same. Um, and as, as you can see here, we have this decreasing trend again, where as we are desiccating the cells, we're losing RNA content relative to that control sample in the desiccated treatment. So a couple things are really interesting about this analysis. Number one, is that we're still able to extract quite a bit of DNA, or sorry, RNA, from cells that have been sitting on filters for 14 days, they're dormant, they're desiccated, um, and we're able to get RNA from them. So this kind of stands in contrast to this notion that RNA is extraordinarily labile, and if you look at it the wrong way, it's gonna break down. We're clearly stressing these cells out, we're clearly making them unhappy, all of our evidence suggests that, um, and we're still able to extract RNA. The other thing I want to point out here is that there's potential evidence that RNA is breaking down in these cells. We're able to extract less RNA from the desiccated samples than the controls. So we have both persistence of RNA to a degree and loss of RNA to a degree. So there seems to be some weird thing going on here. So if we look at all three of these um, charts that I just showed you side by side, here's our survival. We see a decrease in survival with desiccation. Here's our ribonucleosides. We see an increase in ribonucleosides with desiccation. And then we see a loss of RNA with desiccation. It's like, what's going on here? And the most part of parsimonious answer is that the cells are just dying on the filter, right? It's like pretty clear. It's like, well, you're you're making them really unhappy, they're dying on the filter, they're leaking their RNA out, and that RNA is breaking down to some degree. So if that were true, we might expect to see continued relative survival um, uh, after we rehydrate the samples. I haven't showed you what happens when we rehydrate the samples. So 
That last step, so after we desiccate them for two weeks, we rehydrate them with water vapor, very gentle, a gentle um, waking up, if you will. And viability, the survival of them comes right back to the same level as the paired control. So it's almost like this water vapor is just waking these cells back up and they're able to grow just as well as the control on the Petri plates. If we look at the ribonucleosides, they go from being really elevated in this desiccated sample to being completely absent again, or relative to the control, they're, they're in, at the same ratio as the um, paired control. So something's happening to these ribonucleosides. They're no longer present. And when we look at RNA, we see a, evidence for resynthesis of that RNA um, after it's been sitting on that filter and we just rehydrate them. So this kind of led us to this new hypothesis that maybe hydration controls RNA stability inside of the cell to some degree. When they're dry, that RNA becomes unstable, breaks down, and then when they're rehydrated or gently woken up, that stimulates the cell to synthesize new mRNAs from those ribonucleoside pools. So we started looking into this in the literature to say like, well, what do we know about RNA stability? And there are some papers that it's pretty idiosyncratic. There's not a consensus about what happens to RNA. Um, this paper looking at Bradyrhizobium japonicum shows that um, there's, gene, uh, there's gene expression upregulation after 24 and 72 hours of, of desiccation when these cells are like bone dry. How does a gene get upregulated when the cell is effectively dormant? We, we previously showed that when you lose water, the cell goes into this sort of weird, dormant, very stressed out state. There are other papers that show similar findings. This is an actinobacteria, um, also a soil microbe, that they're showing eight times more differentially regulated genes in the treatment relative to the desiccation treatment relative to the control, and that they're maximum, maximally upregulated upon complete drying of the cells. Again, how is this happening biologically? If you dig back even farther in the literature, there's some really cool older literature from the early 90s um, investigating a very desiccation tolerant cyanobacteria, Nostoc commune. And at this point, we didn't have microarrays or anything like that to investigate gene expression. So they were going gene by gene by gene using the best tools they had at the time. I think most of it is blot data. And they showed that RPOC, which is an RNA polymerase required for synthesis of new messenger RNA, um, the transcript for that completely disappears after gen gentle desiccation of these cells. Short-term desiccation, not gentle. Um, and in the same species of microbes, SOD-F mRNA was not only present, but it was abundant and stable in the cells that had been desiccated for a very long period of time. So we have this picture emerging that maybe different gene transcripts are differentially stable in um, desiccated cells. And to my knowledge, this has never been investigated in anything. Um, so digging a little bit farther, we found some papers um, about how RNA is treated in spores, which is the next sort of best metric we have to compare to. And it turns out that RNA, mRNA is actually quite unstable in spores and degrades pretty rapidly after spore formation to provide a, a reservoir of nucleosides for the spore when it starts germinating. So they can synthesize the transcripts that they need when they germinate. And that kind of makes sense when you think about it. How do they know what they're going to wake up to and what genes they're going to need when they wake up? They also, there's also a second paper that describes um, how 23S and 16S ribosomal RNAs degrade over time in these spores. And they show that it really depends on how the spores are treated. So they incubated these at three different temperatures and saw three different uh, spore uh, ribosomal RNA degradation profiles. So that's how bacillus spores and clostridium deal with it. But what about streptomyces? Well, this is a different situation altogether where uh, there's evidence that at least 15 transcripts 
survive spore formation and when the spore germinates are actually translated from those analysis uh, from those um, transcripts. This is just a 2D protein gel um, in cells that have not been treated with an antibiotic that um, inhibits trans uh, transcription and then ones that have been. So these are uh, mRNAs that have persisted through uh, the spore formation process. So this really kind of restructured our whole thought process about what might be going on here. And we have this question of what happens in desiccated cells to these mRNAs and to ribosomal RNAs. Presumably some of them must persist if the cell is gonna wake up upon rehydration. So we wrote a proposal about that and it was funded. So this will be the focus of the next several years of our research group. Uh, I won't get into the details of the um, specific experiments too deep here, but basically we're asking a question whether or not mRNA stability influences desiccation tolerance or not. Um, when um, uh, we're gonna ascertain in classrooms um, here at University of Arizona, the Environmental Microbiology Laboratory, we're gonna measure desiccation tolerance of a bunch of strains that we've isolated in our culture collection. And then we're going to apply a technique that fluorescently labels uh, cells that are actively translating um, uh, mRNAs that have survived desiccation and determine whether or not there's an association between desiccation tolerance and uh, mRNA stability. And then the second part of this proposal, we're gonna actually calculate mRNA half-lives uh, across the, all of the expressed mRNAs in culture under hydrated and desiccated conditions and ask the question, are any of those transcripts significantly more stable under desiccating conditions than in hydrated conditions? In an actively growing cell, mRNAs are turned over on, in under five minutes typically, but clearly there's something going on with stabilization of some of these transcripts in a, in a manner that we don't quite fully understand yet. So hopefully we'll get to the bottom of that. So I'll just wrap up here really quick, um, encouraging all of you and kind of bringing it back to this idea of microbial ecology as sort of this thousand foot perspective looking at um, ecosystem is to, is to kind of keep in mind when you're planning experiments and and analyzing your data of how your assumptions affect the interpretation of your data. So one of the big assumptions with microbial ecology is that when we extract nucleic acids from an environment that it's really representative of that current environment. It's a snapshot of what's important. As a postdoc, one of the papers that I published, we kind of showed that that may not be true for DNA and that in some soils, about half of the DNA might come from dead cells. So are those dead cells important to quantify their community structure? Um, and we showed that it also varies across different soil types. So one of the things that I always get asked when talking about that paper is like, well, why didn't you look at RNA? And the answer is because I don't know that we have more confidence that RNA is a better indicator. We assume that RNA is indicative of viable growing cells, but there was a paper a few years ago that highlighted that the relationship between non-growth activities and concentration of ribosomal RNA and presumably mRNA as well, just really hasn't been investigated. In other words, we, we have a good sense of what ha what's happening with actively growing cells. Of course, they must have RNA in them. But when a cell goes dormant, whatever the mechanism of that is, what happens to that RNA and can we trust those sort of thousand foot perspective analyses in kind of um, um, piecing together microbial activity in these different environments? So with that, I will be happy to kind of close it up and answer any questions you might have about our research, um, uh, or the presentation, and uh, we'll go from there. Thank you very much. Paul, thanks for such a nice talk. That was that was terrific, and I'm with you on the assumption.
like we always use RNA as our marker for things being alive and active. So <laughs> I, I hear you on, on the dangers of that. Um, and it's really interesting. Um, I was wondering, one thing that we do uh, like to hear from our speakers is just a little bit about um, your personal path. Mm. I wonder if you could give us a sentence or two about, um, <clears throat> you know, how, how you got into marine microbial ecology and or how that, how that moved into science uh, of soils for you. Um, yeah, so my career path, I'm, I'm a first generation scientist um, and I, uh, academic college student, um, uh, I didn't actually know what a master's degree was until about six months before I was a master's student, um, didn't know what a doctoral degree was until shortly before I became one. Um, so a lot of it was sort of kind of figuring it out as time went on. Um, I had an interest in marine stuff. Um, really because I had an interest in growing things that were hard to grow. So I think I saw Steve Giovannoni give a talk when I was a master's student, maybe an undergrad. And I thought, wow, that's just really cool. He's trying to grow these things that uh, nobody else can grow. So to have the opportunity to do my doctoral work in his lab was really great. And even while I was there, um, you know, my projects evolved and sort of pivoted as the data led me in new directions. Um, but the marine field can be um, intense sometimes. Um, so I made the decision, intent, intense from the professional side of things. Um, also, it's really complicated to, to, um, to get access to samples. I think you have to, uh, it's not complicated, but it's, it's more challenging. You have to go on cruises. I don't do well on boats. That's a big reason why. Um, where there's all this unexplored diversity literally right below our feet that, um, uh, that we have yet to tap into and really fully understand. And, you know, a lot of the solutions to Earth's problems or humans' problems, rather, Earth probably doesn't have the problems, humans have the problem. Um, those are all going to happen on land. So it's really inter intricate and integral that we understand how these soil microbes are affecting plant productivity and ecosystem services and things like that. So. Awesome. Thank you. It's really nice to, to hear your, your story. Yep. Thanks. Hi, Paul. Uh, if, can I have, uh, I have a question if there's nobody else waiting? Go for it. Yeah. So, um, this, this question of what active means. Um, and one of the things we've tried to do, or and are trying to do, especially in with regard to methane cycling in our site and following permafrost is think about how could you, it does, does it, um, how you might correlate or predict activity like methane production from some measure of microbial activity. And so I'm just wondering if you have an opinion about, is that a, is that a false hope that there's some way that you could that 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 you could predict that from some index, you know, transcripts or or pro, proteomes or what have you? But uh, what what is your th thinking about that? About whether you can predict, uh, you know, actual, you know, so environmental processes or ecosystem processes from indices of microbial activity such as they are. Yeah, methane's pretty uh, is the straightforward one, I think. Um, so the genes that are involved in methane cycling are pretty well characterized and yeah, start simple. Right? We, we, yeah, we recognize them, um, you know, in data sets, it's like, oh, that's a particulate methane monooxygenase or whatever the enzyme might be. So I think that's um, a little bit more straightforward where it gets really challenging is when you are looking at, you know, sugar cycling, for example. Um, it's very difficult to identify what sugar a transporter is transporting. It's, it's difficult to understand how those sugars are going through the metabolic processes in the cells. So I think for certain targeted approaches, methane cycling, nitrogen cycling is another one um, that no, it's not a false hope uh, of doing that. If you see a particulate methane monooxygenase transcript, um, and it's not a desiccated cell apparently, there's a good chance that perhaps um, it's being expressed and that function is active. Um, but for other things, I think it's much less straightforward and by, by quite a bit. And we don't always know that 
you know, most of these genes were characterized in a model system like E. coli or Bacillus subtilis or some crystal clear model system where we know that the gene is upregulated under this specific condition. But we don't know that that is also true in most of these environmental microbes that we study. Maybe they have adopted a different regulatory scheme because that makes sense in their environment. So um, I think it, you know, it's easy to look at it and maybe assume that that's um, what's going on, but without really pinning the tail on the donkey, as I like to say, it's, it's kind of hard to know for sure. Yeah, thanks. Anna. You're, you're muted. Hey, Paul. Uh, great talk. Really cool. Uh, I'm curious about so often desiccation is compared to freezing um, in terms of the effect that it has on cells. I'm curious if you think that what you're finding here may also be applicable in that um, stress that cells might experience in kind of like a seasonal. Um, though maybe not in uh, Arizona. Um, so that was actually brought up in the reviews for the proposal um, at that um, it would be interesting to look at freezing as well, especially if we had problems getting RNA from some of these samples. So yes, we've kind of thought about it. I do think it's a little bit different though in the context of freezing has the effect of um, you know, you're not withdrawing the water from the cell and you potentially have things like ice crystal formation and, and so on and so forth. But it would certainly right. be interesting to see like you know, how stable is RNA in a frozen cell versus in a desiccated cell. Great, yeah. cool. Yeah, did you review my proposal, Anna? <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Other questions? Oh, I, I have one more question. You know, Arthrobacter is such a cool genus. Um, what, what can we learn from in-depth studies that are sort of, you know, focusing on that as an emerging model system that you are developing um, to speak more broadly across, you know, the tremendous phylogenetic diversity of, of uh, bacteria? Yeah, that's a really great question. So, um, as part of the as part of the NSF proposal, we're going to investigate these questions in pretty diverse organisms, just to to basically address that. Um, so, I think we have um, we're planning on doing Arthrobacter because we've kind of already started that, um, but also Mycobacterium, which are also fairly abundant in the soils around here. Um, another gram-positive non-spore-forming microbe. We have some acidobacteria, which we don't really know much of anything about that we're gonna be investigating. Brady rhizobium, uh, flavobacteria. So we're, we're trying to address this question of, across a, a broad range of organisms of is RNA stability sort of dealt with the same way? Or do we see something similar to like what the difference between streptomyces and bacillus spores where they do two totally different things with their mRNA transcripts? Cool. Yeah, that's super neat. I, I bet the flavobacteria stuff's going to be a nice complement to the yeah, rest. That, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thanks for such a nice talk. That was super. You're very welcome. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah. Yes, Paul, thanks a lot. That was a, a, great, a great talk. And you stepped in at the last minute, so that's particularly impressive. <laughs> yeah. I was working on the talk for some other reason. I thought, oh, this will be a good time to, to give it. Do we have any other questions? If not, um, I did want to share that on February 25th, two weeks from today, we have Jenny Cross, Director of the Institute for Research in Social Sciences and Professor of Sociology at Colorado State University. And she's gonna be presenting on building your teaming and collaboration skills in science. And I'm going to go ahead and provide a link in the chat. This will let you see um, 
a list of upcoming presentations for our ecosystem genomics seminar series. And so we hope that you'll be able to make you make some of our other future presentations. Yeah, I could point add to that that you know one of the strategies we talked about for interdisciplinarity bridge building is is connect is is collaboration within teams. So this is a good hands-on sort of insight into how to how those things work and how to make them happen and pitfalls to avoid and things like that. Awesome. Well, great. Let's let's give Paul a round of applause and thanks. Um, I know our students trainees are heading off the class, so we'll join you. And uh, thank you again, Paul. That was fabulous. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Have a great day, everyone. You too. Thank you. Bye bye.